This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. I'm Bob Easter, and I suspect that I've met many of you over the years. I get the opportunity to serve as the interim chancellor these days, and this is the ninth uh, Chancellor Center for Advanced Study special uh, lecture. And we're really pleased this evening to have the opportunity to bring to you uh, Larry Shook. Uh, it, I, I can be accused of being biased in this selection, but I, I wasn't. <laughs> The recommendation came forward, and, and I was pleased to, to send it on to Dr. Uh, Dr. Shook and ask that be, he be involved. You know Larry. He's a faculty member in the Department of Animal Sciences. I think probably joined our faculty in the early 1980s. Uh, it's somewhere back in the misty past. Uh, he has had a number of, of responsibilities throughout his career. He uh, made a really bad decision sometime in the late 80s and wandered off to Minneapolis, St. Paul, where he was Director of Food and Animal Biotechnology Center and Associate Dean for Research from 1993 to 2000. And we were fortunate to be able to recruit him back under the Faculty Excellence Program in, in the late 90s, 1998. Just a word or two about his, his history. He, he's from Michigan. His B.A. was from Albion College. His master's and his doctorate were Wayne State School of Medicine. He did a postdoc at the Institute of Clinical Immunology at the University of Bern. And then he was a postdoctoral fellow for two years at the uh, University of Michigan, visiting Professor Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research, uh, University of Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, Dr. Shook has a, a rather lengthy list of appointments on this campus, and I'll just read a few of them. Uh, Edward William and Jane Marr Gutskull Professor, uh, which is the highest honor that we can give as a campus. Director of the Division of Biomedical Sciences, Professor of Animal Sciences, also has an appointment as a professor in bioengineering, nutritional science, pathology, and surgical oncology. Uh, he's a professor in the Institute for Genomic Biology. Uh, Larry has received many recognitions, as you might expect, from an individual of this nature. He's a university scholar, uh, the highest recognition that our campus gives to a scholar, or our university. Uh, the College of ACES, he received the Paul A. Funk Award for Meritorious and Outstanding Research, the Pfizer Award for Research Excellence, recently elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. Larry's had a, a great many other uh, activities outside of, of the university that contribute to his, his uh, understanding of his field. President and Chairman, Board of Directors, Midwest Molecular Diagnostics and Champaign Consultant, uh, UNDP, Food and Agricultural Organization for Biotechnology and Immunology, uh, Science Board Advisor, North Carolina Biotechnology Center, a uh, board member of, uh, member of the Scientific Advisory Board for PIXIS, uh, chair of the International Swine Genome Sequencing Consortium, and I know a bit about that. Uh, Larry, perhaps 10 years ago, had the notion that uh, the federal government should fund a, a major project to sequence the pig genome, and uh, he went out to Washington and was told there wasn't any money, and Larry came back and went to work, and. Uh, strong-armed is probably not too of an inappropriate word, uh, a number of individuals, and in time there came to be something in excess of 20 million and perhaps more available within the U.S. to, to participate in an international sequencing effort, and Larry led that effort, which culminated successfully about a year ago. He serves as editor-in-chief of Animal Biotechnologies on the editorial board of Journal of Biomedicine and Biotechnology, 
And the title of Dr. Shook's lecture tonight is The T.J. Tabasco Genome Story, A Porcine, Porcine Blueprint for Agriculture, Life, and Biomedical Science. Dr. Shook. Well, this is always a wonderful occasion to share a story, and, and, I, and I really appreciate everyone who took the time to come here today. And, and what I want to share with you is not only my story, but it'll be, a, a, I think, a series of stories. And, and, and what I've tried to do for this evening is try to put together an effort to capture the diversity of the pig in the experimental models, and as, and as the chancellor shared, bring to you the idea that this is an experimental model. Uh, what I'd like to challenge you with is that unlike most animals, the wild animal is still very abundant throughout the world. And we can use that as a, to study the approaches for what we can conceptualize as domestication and begin to use new tools to answer some what I think are exciting biological questions. My presentation this evening has been broken down into three components. First, I would like to share a little bit about TJ, an important person in, in my life the last decade, and, and, and really provide some historical perspectives of why the pig and why Illinois. I'd like to spend the majority of my time uh, talking about the concept of back to the future, how we begin to use genomic sciences and technologies to pro provide us an opportunity to look backwards and and better understand the concepts of domestication, speciation, and the development of modern breeds uh, that have arisen. And then finally, I'll close with some comments about the future. You know, there's a lot of discussions about why sequencing, what's the value proposition, this seems like a lot of money, and I hope to share with you some ideas about how this information really can become very important, not only in the life sciences, but in agriculture and biomedical sciences. So T.J. Tabasco, why pigs, why the Illinois Femme Fatale? And first I want to share a little bit of story about who she is, what are her roots, and I want to reflect on the shared history between humans and animals uh, as we move from hunter-gatherers to farmers because there's a, a, an incredible story here that, that's evolving. And the second story I want to share with you is that how these kinds of studies really can provide insights into health and behavior. Let me just share a couple things, because people talk about genomics and genetics. And when, what we really refer to here is when we re talk about genetics, we're referring to the idea of looking at one gene at a time. And then when we talk about sickle cell anemia, we're talking about what kind of changes have occurred in that gene that are affecting disease. When we're talking about genomics, we're talking about being able to, to look at all the genes that are in an individual animal's uh, genome, can, all of them at once. And the idea here is that we now can be able to look at complex interactions. We can begin to look at not only single genes that are affecting the disease, but we can begin to look at things such as cardiovascular disease, behavior, complex physiological parameters, and capture all that information. Well, so genomics is something that really um, started in 1990 is an idea of self-discovery. And if you're, any of you have read Jet Daniel Bordstein's book, and I have to admit I'm, as many of you know, not really a humanist, but I think this is one of the greatest books that I've ever written, read, is Jealousy, um, is that man continues to search for, for in, in, in our universe. And the genomics really represents, in many ways, the last frontier. It represents our ability to look within ourselves and be asked questions about what we are, how we got to where we are, and begin to look at not only historical perspectives on uh, the movement and development of human race, but also diseases. So the inward journey started in 1990, uh, where we had the space programs and we had other aspects to begin to look within ourselves of how we are composed and looking at be able to predict, which is going to be some of the exciting and also challenging aspects of, from a social and policy issues about who we are and what we are and what our risks are and self, uh, 
motivations, if you will, in terms of health. But it also represented an international program uh, where many groups around the world came together to begin to look at searching and sequen sequencing the, the, the genes of the human. It was completed in April 2003, um, so 13 years to sequence the human genome. When I throw that out, because what we'll share about is that we're in real time today, and we're talking about in Beijing, they just built a genome center that can do 250 human genomes a week. So the technology here is daunting in the last few years. So from a historical perspective, I'd like to share with you that it all kind of began, and, and I'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more detail in terms of about 10,000 uh, before president across Europe and Asia where the domestication of, of wild animals began. But more recent history was the idea of creating breeds in the 1700s where we began to look at the idea of modern agriculture in terms of genetic selection for animals that had specific uh, attributes. Well, the real action really began here, and I want to make this a little bit Illinois-centric with Ben Rasmussen and some pioneer work uh, here at the, in animal sciences where we began to look at some of the important traits that were associated with, with pork production. And Ben was a president of International Society for Animal Genetics and a tremendous uh, pioneer in this area, and this really put, in many ways, internationally, Illinois in the, in the middle. But what I have here in this center mirror is, is really the, the time point I want to use as a, a reflection for tonight. And that was uh, Harris, Luna, and I in 1990, as a result of the Human Genome Initiative being started, hosted what we referred to as Allerton One Conference, where we began to bring in, and we had individuals from all over the world to come and talk about how we could begin to utilize the same kinds of technologies to address livestock genomics in, in, throughout the world. Again, ten, uh, five years later, we hosted another conference on animal genomics where we began to look at the implications of this, uh, going from science, but also the value proposition. Uh, 2000, as uh, is, uh, the chancellor referred to, is, was when we started to really get serious and began to look at a blueprint of what we needed and what, the, what we, and at that time, um, uh, Dean Shequin and department head uh, Bob Easter were very supportive of, of us moving forward and, and initiating uh, a, a genome sequencing initiative here uh, on campus. And as I'll talk about, in 2005, we were able to then to secure significant funding from the USDA with some matching funding from the uh, private sector to begin the sequence of pig genome. And the excitement was in, in Five years later, last November, we were able to complete that. Well, this is what it looked like in the beginning, in 1990. Uh, as I say, the Human Genome Project just started. Uh, Harris and I were invited to a Banbury conference at Cold Spring Harbor to look at agriculturally important animals, and I was asked to put together a status report on the pig. And I think you can see that was a rather easy task. There was uh, seven linkage groups and maybe 30 genes that were, had been identified. That was the status. And that's how I say it seems like and 20 years ago. And I, I remind people that when, uh, when um, I was hired here, I worked in mouse genetics. And I said, this is going to be a simple thing. It'll take a couple years, and we'll begin to have pigs look like mice. And, you know, and 20 years later, we, we did it. So I, um, so I was a little off on the timing. But this five, last five years have just been lightning speed, and, and, this, and it's happened through a number of initiatives. Uh, and, I say, and I share this in the, in the, in the sense of a global co uh, collaboration, that, which has been a personal and a professional uh, wonderful experience. Myself and John Beaver here at Illinois, our colleagues uh, uh, Denny Mar uh, Milan and Patrick Chardon, again, because of ACEs having these linkages with INRA, we began to have some real international collaborations and a, a longtime friend and colleague, Alan Archibald, in Edinburgh at the Roslyn, we began to, to put together a physical map of the pig genome as the scaffold for being able to move forward. We then began the sequencing project, and in, uh, no, in November, we, we actually had a, a conference where we, we announced that we were done. So uh, five years, we went forward. And I want to keep these time frames and how fast things are beginning to move. And so in, so in 20 years, we went from knowing about 30 genes to now we know all about all 25,000, 
And from having, if you will, seven linkage points, we now have 2.8 billion information bits. So as I said, the, the time course here, and I just don't want to stress this too much, but I think it'll become evident at the end of my talk about how fast things are moving and how the questions that we want to answer become more realistic to approach. And that is in the 20 years since we started 1990 to where we are now, it's, it's a, we can go a million times faster, we get five times more information, and it's a thousand times quicker. And we keep looking at the number of people involved. So now we went, when we first started the human genome, it was five international centers. There were thousands of people involved. It took $3 billion, and they got 5x coverage. Uh, now, in a week, in, our, in the Keck Center, we can get 30x coverage with, for about $30,000. So we went from having to have an international centers and international collaboration to something that can be done in our own laboratories in a week. So the questions that can be asked become really important. And they're important ones, and that's what I want to share with you for the rest of this evening. So my thoughts are then, as I said, back to the future. Because the technology now allows us to look back to see how genomes have changed over time. We can now look at the changes that occur in a genome as a reflection of speciation, domestication, or its genetic selection, because we can look at all the genes and we can begin to look at what's happened in that genome as a result of man's interactions. So I want to share a little bit of what we've seen in terms of domestication. I want to particularly focus on TJ's roots in this whole thing and, and her role as being the important, if you will, yardstick, the gold standard in which we compare everything to. Um, I also then want to talk about some ideas about modern breeding. But the important thing is I've got here is genomic signatures. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if we take an animal and we've made selections, there should be changes in its genome that have been, all animals would be shared. And that the, we, we look at 100 animals, we all say, well, this, is, this, is, this piece of the, uh, the genome has been changed in all these animals, which is a reflection of the process in which they've gone through. And I'll illustrate that in, in a second. Because the concept of domestication is one, and this is you know, a Darwin and Boer, where the idea is that we take on domesticated animals, and any of you have looked, read the Guns, uh, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond know that he, he, he points to the idea that there were eight or nine species and, and, and that, it, that were domesticated. But the point is, is that what's happened is that through this captive breeding that there are some combination of genetic select, uh, changes that have occurred over gener uh, generations. So we ask the question, could we be able to see those? If they've happened and all animals that have been domesticated have gone through the same little bottleneck, we should be able to see that signature in the genomes of animals that have been domesticated whereas wild animals wouldn't have had that, that, that exposure. So we asked the question, can we see it? And then secondly, what genes are those? What, what, are they, what does that really tell us about the changes that have occurred as a result of domestication? So what do we mean by domestication? In the pig, it's an interesting one, and these are some samples we've, we've, we've done ourselves, um, where for the most part, when we look at classification between that wild boar and, and the domesticated animals, most of it's a reflection of changes in the shape of the face. Uh, the, the, the snout gets longer. But most of them are, are, are really have to do with changes in behavior. And behavior in the sense that the pig uh, has, it, it makes nests, if you will, in the wild. We're used to seeing pigs in commercial operations. But as wild animals, they, 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 they nest. We'll talk about some of their behaviors in terms of migration and packs. But they have a very different social strata and social implications as a result of domestication. So we asked some questions. And the questions were, do wild and domestic animals represent opposite ends of a spectrum in this continuum? As I said, the pig's an interesting animal because throughout Europe and Asia still, the wild ancestor animals are doing very fine, if you will. In fact, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and the people in, from, from Italy, from Tuscany, were saying that in Tuscany, they're having to call 20,000 wild boar a year uh, because of the damage they're doing to the vineyards. So when they say that these are animals that do really well, uh, they're, they're surviving really well. So we have a, a cohort that's incredible. We also wanted to see, could we identify changes in their genomes, these signatures that I talked about, that dis distinguish between these groups? And then the idea is there an intermediate phase, or is this an all or none? 
And then what I'll talk about some studies we're trying to do is, is it reversible? Uh, we see about all these feral pigs that get back out and begin to breed again. And one of the interesting things, as you see, is that they begin to revert physiologically to look like wild animals. And so the argument is, do they, do they revert? Or is domestication an endpoint that is not reversible? So let me share a little bit about the what we did. Um, so what we've done is we've collected DNA samples from wild populations from all over the world, and I'll share you with, with that, and also from domesticated populations that have been derived from those wild animals in, in those very specific regions. And we've also, uh, from domestic populations that represent separate domestication events, and I'll show you in a moment a slide of some elegant work done by a, a colleague of ours, Gregor Larson, who's actually been able to show that pig domestication has been a result of, of man's movement from hunter-gatherer to farmer where they've captured animals in very distinct... So the domestication of pig has happened more than once. It's not like in some animal species where there was a single event and the animals were spread, but what's happened here is the animals had spread and then they were domesticated in, in very specific areas. And, and, and so the how is that we then use these new sequencing technologies to look at their genomes of these individual animals and that we've used TJ's uh, DNA sequence as our gold standard, so we can begin to look at uh, what changes have, have occurred. Let me also remind you that, that there are some aspects that we've taken advantage of that are, that are interesting, and one is I'll talk about mitochondrial DNA. And I'll remind you that mitochondrial DNA is inherited from the mother. So by looking at the mitochondrial DNA, it allows us then to look at the origins of an animal from its maternal side. And that's because the mitochondrial are in the, are in the egg, the ovum. And so when, when, when we, all of us have mitochondrial that we have inherited from our mother. Whereas when we talk about the nuclear DNA, that's inherited from both, both parents. So we can use that as, in, in as I, it's shown here, uh, this has been, uh, this using, the, in human populations, we've been able to track the, out of Africa, you know, Eve out of Africa throughout the world by tracking and making maps of, of mitochondrial DNA. So this is a, an analysis that we can do and we've used with using in the pig. We also have taken advantage of access in looking at the history of the pig uh, from speciation events during um, through domestication periods around the world. And, and this has been done by collecting uh, archaeological samples from around the world that we've been able to get access to. We've also been ha have access to museum pieces uh, that, that have allowed us to go back in certain capture of, of time, and then also uh, aspects of using uh, biological. So we've collected samples, and that's allowed us then to do an analysis of these populations by looking at ancient or archaeological samples, those in the museum, as I've just shared, the wild boar that's contemporary that's still across the world, as well as the domestic animal. And then by using the mitochondrial DNA, it allows us to look, ask questions about what are the maternal origins of, of those samples. By using nuclear, we can look at where the nuclear origins were, that's the mother and father, but we also now have been de developed uh, markers uh, on the Y chromosome so we can now begin to look at the paternal origins. So when we look at movement around animals, we can tell when the maternal origins have been, and we can now begin to look at the, the paternal origins of those, those breeds. And I say this because it becomes important in terms of when we looked at the movement of animals around the world, I'll show some uh, information later about the movement of uh, pigs from the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and Portugal to South America five, six hundred years ago. We begin to now be able to track those animals from what their origins were from a maternal side as well as what happens in, in the local. And I'll show that this is going to be an important aspect when we talk about the implications of climate and acclimation of different environments to the growth and development of animals. As I sh said earlier, the pig represents a really interesting model, and, and I'm Al Roca is here, and he, he still challenges this, but maybe we'll convince Al through the next couple of years, is that, that the pig actually has been domesticated in very different spots in the world. And in Europe, there's been two events, and we were looking at pigs from Corsica and Sardinia uh, that, that are a separate event from Northern Europe. There's a Middle East, this will become important a little bit later, 
But then, not surprising, in Asia, there's, there's been a number of events, and there's this hotbed of, if you will, the genesis of, of the pigs throughout the, the, um, the islands there. So the global distribution, as you say, the wild animals are shown here in, in green, still are associated throughout Europe and Asia, other than the Himalayas and the, and the, and the, and the tundra. So they, they have a remarkable, if you will, uh, distribution and so that's the wild animals. And when we look at what's happened in Europe over the last five or 600 years, there's really been the development of about 250 breeds that represent about 50% of the, of the global breeds that have happened. So what does that mean? That means in, in, within Europe, over the last millennium, people have been trapping animals, domesticating them, and then using selective breeding. So two events have been happening there, this domestication and selective breeding. And in some work that we did uh, uh, looking at the genetic analysis, we then began to ask, when did the breed divergence really occur? So when was this happening? So if you look at uh, the Duroc, which is what T.J. Tabasco, about 5,000 years ago, that breed was being, being developed from local populations. So we can begin, again, using genetic information, go back and retrack when these breeds were being selectively bred uh, from different populations. And in Asia, uh, there's about 100, 200 breeds. And again, uh, those of you familiar on campus, we've had this Maison uh, pig that we imported uh, in, the, in the late 1980s that really was one of the first breeds that Hex, if you will, had been uh, defined by selective breeding uh, about 12,000 years ago. So that'd be one of the first, if you will, events that probably happened. So over the last five years, uh, and uh, colleagues throughout the world, we've put together uh, over 2,500 samples that represent, if you will, representative popula animals from the representative populations of the wild boar, shown in green throughout Europe and in Asia. We've taken samples of domestic pigs that have been produced by, from those wild populations. We also have, as I said, museum and archaeological samples. We've got feral pigs that we're looking at that have been, that have been released for four or 500 years now. And then related sewage, uh, which I'll talk about at the end of my talk, that, that are, uh, if you will, cousins, that, so we can have some outgroups and be in to understand what the aspects of those animals are. So these 2,500 samples have now been analyzed. And we've done this by two ways. And one is by using a SNP analysis. and, and and this is just really a, a technique that what I call is digitizing the genome. It really asks questions about is something there or not there. So we could begin to easily genotype animals. Um, and so this SNPs or this uh, single nucleotide polymorphism is a really a, a way of us being able to track changes over time where we see in one case an animal might have a T and in another case the animal will have a C. And, and we've done this by taking and making pools of animals. So in this case, we've gone into these populations. We've collected 25 to 100 wild boars that represent a single location. We've gone to another location and said, OK, what are the domestic animals or the, the local breeds that, that would have been derived from that? We've made another population. So we've made a series of libraries. And then using this new sequencing techniques, um, we've taken these animals that, represent, that are representative of these different kinds of breeds and populations. And we've sequenced, and I think I use this as an example. So I think you can see that in this single spot, there's this SNP, if you will, that goes from either a G or a C. So we began to look at these traces. And the point for our discussions this evening is that this is just meant to be a landmark, that this is a spot in the genome that can change, and we can use it to follow a given population versus another. And by using this approach, we've now created uh, 65,000 of these landmarks across the pig genome. So we can begin to look at the origins of every little segment of that genome uh, throughout a, a segment where it comes from across the whole genome. Uh, and this is work that we just uh, finished this last year. And I just think you talk about remarkable technologies that so each one of these little squares here has these 65,000 little markers in there that you can begin to do an analysis on a single animal and be able to break down its genome. And, and now there, there is. Uh, similar types of uh, technologies that can have a million on there for humans. So the technology that allows us to look at individual differences is amazing. 
And as I said, we've also been able to use mitochondrial DNA to be able to, to break down the different groups in that. And also, as I said, we have SNPs that are on the Y chromosome that do two important things. One, they allow us to group all the Asian wild boars. So we now can distinguish between a wild boar that is unique for Asia as opposed to the wild boars that are, that are seen and, and that, we, that are observed in, in, in Europe and in, in, in the Middle East. So those two populations have diverged over a long period of time, and we can distinguish the paternal origins of an animal, whether it's from Asia or Europe. So let's talk a little bit about the modern breeds. And we've done an analysis. Uh, this is uh, Cafe Chang in my lab and a colleague, Martin Gronin. Uh, where we've looked at breeds from all over the world and begun to do a genetic analysis. And the reason for this was that one of the challenges that Darwin had is that if we do domestic breeding, that we, we can go in certain directions, but once you get there, you can't go any farther. And there's been this concern that as we use practices of modern agriculture, that we're going down a blind alley and this is dangerous and we'll never get out of that and we'll be reducing. That's an argument that's made, and it's been made strongly. What I want to leave you with this evening is that I think that argument's got a long way to go. And one of the remarkable things we've seen with, at least in the pig, as I said, there's 200 breeds still in, 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 in Asia, and there's another 300 in, in Europe, and the diversity is still remarkable. But using our techniques, we can begin to put these, and this is just, again, using the same type of approach that we use with the mitochondrial, we can begin to separate breeds and look at whether they're chi from China or Asia or they're from Europe. And we, as I say, we can begin to separate the wild boar from Europe versus the wild boar from Asia. So the population control. So we can go back and delineate these populations. And again, being able to do this, we can go back and reconstruct a, a history. And I'll show you about TJ's history in a, in a moment that allows us to go backwards by understanding the origins of each of these samples. So we've asked some questions about breed uh, differentiation in Europe and, and also, I mean, sorry, in, in, in Asia. And on the top here is China, where we've taken, as I say, samples from across China. And we've done our analysis. And we can begin, and I think you can see here, very nicely by doing an analysis, tell you exactly the location of where that breed came from. And that's based on the idea that we, that, that Within these populations, and this is, and I should say that if any of you are human geneticists, that this is a, something that's also been very observed within the human uh, ethnic groups within China. And China represents an area where there has not been a lot of movement across the country by man, nor have they then taken their animals with them. So it's a, it's a unique opportunity to test this model where we, as you can see, cluster the, the, the animal uh, populations very uniquely. This could, this would not, in the United States, it would just be all over because we move animals all over the place. But it allows us then to look at the interactions in different environments. On the bottom panel is a study that we just uh, completed uh, with our colleague uh, Miguel uh, Perez Incensu, who actually was here. He's at the University of Barcelona, and I'll, I'll share a proud moment. I never knew he had been here, but he had been here. Uh, in the mid-1980s, uh, working with Dan Gianola, and uh, has now gone on and has uh, done remarkable work at the University of Barcelona. But this is where we've taken samples from the Americas. So this is looking at the movement of pigs into Central and South America, and, America, uh, and here in North America, and, and begin to recapitulate and look at their origins. And on the far right here is the, what the color here ref represents the snips that are coming from the wild boar. And here's the Asian breeds, here's our Duroc. And as you can begin to see that, um, that in, in South America, there's, there's, a, there's a, a change that happens that's reflective of the movement of animals in and out of the country, the origins. But we, I just want to share with you that we can really go in and begin in a geographical location, begin to ask what were the origins and the composition of these animals and reconstruct the, their, their patterns. Well, I, I mentioned earlier that we were interested, could we see actual signatures of, of change that are in the genome of an animal. And the concept here is this idea of selective sweep signatures and uh, work that's, uh, this is from an article, Leif Anderson, a close colleague of, of Harris and mine, it's in Sweden, and Michelle George. And, um, and if the idea here is that 
if you have an ancestral population and there's been no selection, that the frequency of all these SNPs should, should really stay the same, that, there's, that they're all being equally seen in the, in the, in the uh, population of animals, and so that there really isn't an opportunity. But if there is a location that has really importance to that, that breeder's survival, if you will, then you'll see a, a change because it'll, in a sense, be fixed. And so we should be able to see that when we look in, in, into population. So here's an example of where we have been able to see that. Uh, and here's the different breeds, the wild boar in the bottom, and these are just current breeds. And here's a location on chromosome 8 where you can begin to see that in the wild animals there's not much variation where it's been fixed, whereas in the other populations you can begin to see it. So we've, we've done this through the genome where we've asked, what, what, what is really being changed? What's the, what's the, what are the genes controlling? And what we've seen is that they fall into two categories. Not surprisingly, when we look at the commercial breeds, we see that there's been this fixation for genes that control growth and muscle. But the other important one that we didn't under, fully appreciate was that we'd begin to see very significant changes in, in those regions that control genes that are associated with behavior. So there has been, and this is what we're going to continue to focus on, there has been, if you will, a, it, an indirect genetic selection for domesticated animals that actually has an effect on genes that control behavior. And that's an area that we'll continue to pursue in the next several years, but do some fine structure. But so there is a very distinctive pattern, if you will, of those regions that are associated with genes associated with behavior that have been fixed, if you will, in domestic pattern. Now our friend the wild boar is very interesting because this is an animal that obviously survives in some really tough environments uh, without having an opportunity to go to the, 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 you know, see the veterinarian very often. And so in this case, what we've been able to see is that there's been an incredible amount of enrichment for genes that are associated with for the immune response. So this is an incredibly hardy animal. And I, and I bring that up because one of the, the, one of the holy grail of animal sciences and, and veterinary sciences has been the ability to select animals for disease resistance. The idea that we could begin to identify and understand how we could have animals that were healthier and, and we wouldn't have to do vaccinations and give butyl antibiotics. And so this is interesting in the sense that those genes are, and our argument is, is that survival is, is one of the strongest fit selection criteria. Uh, and so the, the ability to have that kind of intense selection pressure for survival has, is maintained, it, and, it's, and we're now looking at those. And, and, uh, and this is a little more complicated because we really don't understand the, the, what, what they're really being, uh, if you will, uh, resistant to. But uh, suffice it to say that the approach is we are identifying regions that, that are really interesting. And I'll show an example of, of looking at, at genes that, uh, in an animal that, that does have some uh, relevance to, to humans. So let me shift in, and talk a couple more minutes about the idea of of speciation, because this has been an interesting one, and, and one that I think the pig can play an, an interesting role for. Because the pig uh, has these cousins, uh, Sus varicosis, Sus celebensis, and Sus barbatus, that are really interesting in the sense that they are recognized as unique species, but they have the same karyotypes. There has been no gross changes in, in, in their genome. Uh, the, if you look at the karyotype of one that is looking at a, a picture of all their chromosomes, they would look exactly the same. And so there's been significant changes, not necessarily through rearrangements that, that are usually associated with some speciation events, but the idea that there's been changes in, in their core sequence that, that, that's attributed to their speciation. They've also diverged over a very short period of time. So this is, in a sense, kind of a capture, if you will, speciation in a very short period of time. And the other thing that's interesting is, is that they've, they've really diverged, if you will, in, in a very similar geographic location. So there's not a lot of where you can argue one was in the North Pole and one was in, in the desert. So, there, but, so throughout Malaysia and, 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 and uh, Indonesia, the, these animals have, have, if you will, diverged in speciation. I say in the same location because as soon as I say that, I'll share with you that what is other interesting is that some of these speciation events have occurred on, on if you will, single islands like uh, uh, Java and Jakarta. So, uh, so that there are some unique aspects of, 
an island population that we're now being able to look at in terms of the speciation aspects. So using next generation sequencing, and this is work we're doing at the uh, Martin Gronin, my uh, colleague in, in Wageningen, uh, we've, we've done here at the, the Keck Center over the last year. We've sequenced these other species um, and, and then we've been able to use that information to look at what's changing in those environments. And what I want to share with you again is the idea we picked these ones first, not, not just because they were the easiest one, but because we picked them, as I said, because they had very different attributes and behavior. So we were, again, trying to understand, could we look at their genomes and see areas that had changed that were unique for different behaviors? And on the one that the celebensis here, again, this is uh, the Suwazi. It's found on a single island in Indonesia. So it has a very unique population. Uh, it has a very interesting phenotype with these, uh, these uh, facial warts and, and, and these tufts. Uh, and, and, it, and it has, I uh, don't have time to go on, but some unique uh, mating behaviors. So that represents a very distinct, if you will, cousin. And I think most, many of us could say it, it kind of looks like a pig, too. The other one is the bearded pig that, that's here on the bottom. Uh, and this is actually seen, again, um, on several islands, but still very located, uh, restricted. Um, and this one has some very interesting behavior because they actually are in a family group, but then they, they, they come together during the rainy season and they actually make a community and, and migrate together. And, and there's some social structure with uh, mothers and their children. So there's, there's a very high order of social behavior here, and that's one of the areas that we're interested in and continue to look at. Um, the other two that I'll bring to your attention that we've looked at is the, is the common warthog, shown here on the top, that's from Africa, so it gives us a different geographical thing. And this one's interesting because of its resistance to swine uh, fever, which is, an, which is a very uh, important disease. Uh, so this animal is, is close relative, which is a carrier, doesn't get the disease, and so we're interested in comparing what signatures we have there to give us some insights in, in disease resistance. And then finally, the Javan warty pig, again, it's only found on Java. Um, and that this is actually an important one we've been working with the group at, in, ja in Jakarta on because uh, it's, it's an endangered species and we're, we're using some of this technology to then assist in, in captive breeding programs because part of the problem is that some of these animals still hybridize and when you're trying to do breeding you don't know if it's really still half wild boar. And so this has been a really, provided some very useful insights into, into their, their breeding program. And again, uh, they have some, um, th this animal has some unsocial behaviors that we're, that we're interested in. And suffice it to say, we have been able to identify some genomic signatures, and I think you can see the differences between, in this case, uh, the Seuss varicosis and the Seuss, uh, the pig. Uh, and again, many of these are associated with genes that, are, that, are, that we link to the immune system. But the other ones that are really interesting are the olfactory receptors. And this is a smell receptor. So now we're beginning to see that, you know, the, the behavior of some of these animals is, is, in some ways, is being controlled by divergence of, of their ability to distinguish smells within these populations. And that this is, an, uh, again, a, an area for mammalian biology because the olfactory receptors is one that we're discovering is probably the most diverse and largest gene families of, of, of any in, in, in all the mammals. Uh, and it's just fully being appreciated of how smell has, has a real profound effect on, on different species and, 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 and our ability to distinguish uh, uh, even mating patterns. So let me close by sharing a few concepts about lessons learned. Uh, and I want to go back to TJ's roots. So what, what do, what do we, we learn from this kind of approach? Well, as I share with you, we've learned that yeah, the, this Eurasia has been, a, is, is where, the, if you will, the, the, the root uh, of, the, of the genomes is, is coming from in terms of the wild animals. It continues to, to emerge, uh, and it looks like the activity of speciation is continuing to look, and the pseudoforms is continuing to diverge. Many of these species, I don't want to talk about too much tonight, can still hybridize. So there's still this idea that there's a the continuing emergence of new species that, that's happening with these animals. But we also know that from 
her roots that she that her both her her or if you will her grandparents had origins in the Middle East. If you remember, I said that in, there was that one of the domestication places was in the Middle East, and we know that that's probably that her some of her roots came from. And if you will, the Crescent Valley in, 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 in the Middle East, so where the animals were being domesticated and were being brought in, that's, that's where her roots that came from. She then moved to Europe, but what we see with, in Europe is that animals were brought into Europe from the Middle East as, as humans brought animals in and, and migrated and went in. But then a second thing happened is that they now continued to create new breeds. They continue to now have to take animals that from a second domestication event in Europe and took those animals and now began to breed and make selection for modern breeds. And then she then, like many of us in this room, had ancestors that came from Europe and, and, and to America. And, uh, and this has been an interesting one because the Durag pig, for those of you who are, who are interested, is, is, is really the outliers of many of the breeds. And that's because there has been continued selection here in the United States. But so you can break down her, her roots from originally in the Middle East, family migrating to uh, uh, being brought by humans into Europe. But then a second, if you will, in, uh, interjection of animals that had been domesticated in Europe now being brought into to her background. So in terms of lessons learned, in terms of the domestication story, we, we can say that both the domestic and wild animals have a distinguishing gen, uh, genomic signature and that these are associated with health and behavior. So that, that part, and we're, we're continuing to resolve that further. And that the fitness genes uh, and energy, and I didn't talk a little bit about, but the pig obviously needs, and that's out in the wild, it still has some survival issues in terms of food. So there's some issues in uh, some brown fat and, and other genes that are associated with the ability to, to uh, store energy and, and better utilize energy. In development of breeds, as I said, out of Asia, which is where, uh, is, is common, uh, a, a movement of both wild and domestic animals. So it's, it, it appears that when you saw animals going into, throughout Indonesia, these were not just domestic animals. These were both wild and, and, and if you will, domesticated breed stocks were being moved by people around. There is evidence in the America, Americas that the Spanish were taking wild animals they, they caught and threw them on a boat and took them to South America. These were not their best breeding stocks. And I'm reminded of a, some stories that Chip Burkhardt told earlier uh, in a talk he gave, in this, I think in the same room, about uh, bringing animals from the uh, kangaroos from Australia to uh, to to uh, Paris and for the king and, and hoping that some of them survived. And, and I thought about that in, in this story because it seems to me that clearly you weren't going to take your, your best breeding stock and put them on a boat and hope that they survived for three months until they got to America. So I have a feeling they just capture everything they can and throw them on. And, and, and that story continues and, and, and that's part of it. Speciation. Uh, again, uh, the fit immune response and energy become uh, really important as well as the, the behavior traits. In terms of future perspectives, I just want to close by adding some comments about uh, agriculture and biomedical sciences. As I, I, this evening, was, most of my remarks have been about some ideas of understanding mammalian evolution and diversity, but I do, I do want to spend some time because one of the arguments uh, in terms of getting funding for the pig genome sequence is that we made some promises, uh, and I'm, I'm reminded of those by some of the funding agencies almost on a weekly basis. Um, and, and, and they're fair promises. We made promises that if you gave us money to sequence the pig genome, we would be able to understand biology better. And I think the immune response and energy and food, food utilization are some of those, and behavior are some of those promises. But we also promised that by the pig is a, is, is a, uh, a part of my own research, is a very good model for, for human diseases, particularly obesity, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And so by having that information, we can begin to build stronger models for looking at biomedical sciences. And, and then also in agriculture, important ideas of better understanding genes and in, in, in their, in their environment and how food production becomes important. 
So let me just close by a couple comments about how we're addressing these two. As I said, we're interested in this transition of wild to domestic to feral because in many ways, if you get some of the feral pigs, you really can't physiologically distinguish them from. So there's, there's some plasticity, if you will, in terms of their phenotypes. So we really do want to understand some aspects of is, is domestication reversible? You know, uh, a conversation that's really good over a couple of beers is, you know, can we distinguish, a, is there a pig Eve? And, um, and this is work that um, Gregor Larson and Martin Grona and myself are continuing to look at and collecting more samples because it appears that there, there, there are Eves. We don't, that in this case, there doesn't seem that there is an Eve, but there are many Eves, and we're trying to better understand that, that concept. Um, and again, this idea that there were, we need to do some further work, and the idea is that are all of these animals that have been domesticated, they all have the same signature. We, we, when we did our first analysis, we, 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 we lumped them, so we had domesticated animals versus none, but now we'd like to go back and get more samples from each of these different events and ask questions are, is, is domestication, you know, is there something that's unique and common, or is there a certain combination of changes that, that give you the same endpoint? Another aspect of looking at diversity is one which I said is that this concern that by selective breeding commercially that we're, we're limiting the gene pool and that's, that's taking us to enter it. So uh, a project uh, uh, my collaborator Martin Grona and I have been able to get is through the EU is we have a, a you know, the human has a, a thousand genomes, we have a hundred genome project now where we're looking at all the major breeds uh, in Europe as well as in Asia and, 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 the wild, and, and, and going to, to do a, a better job, if you will, of, of that inventory. And as I said, the prices keep going down, so that the, the questions of the, the experiments we can, we can do uh, be, become important. And that's to, to really address some of the ideas about, you know, what is the, 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 the amount of variation that still exists. In terms of agriculture, and it's interesting that the new uh, call for proposals just came out, and one of the big arguments has been uh, this climate acclimation, you know, a lot of work that's been done in plants, and, and the idea of, you know, animals being able to adapt to unique uh, environments and, and their ability to survive and, and acclimate to those environments. And so in one of the studies uh, that's being led by our, our colleague, uh, 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 Miguel is is we've collected samples from all over the globe of pigs that had been moved by man uh, more than 500 years ago. So the idea is that these are animal breeds that have been taken and been trapped, if you will, by by man and have now acclimated, if you will, for 500 years. And some people say, well, that's not very long. But if you look at modern breeds that have been under genetic selection, this is probably since 1950. So this is, you know, 500. So we have animals and the idea of being able to understand that. So we've done that. And there's just some pictures of, I think you can see, this is a, a pig in Cuba that's, uh, that uh, has been able to survive the heat. Here's another one from, I think this is Argentina up in the mountains. Uh, and you can see, I think it's real clear to say that they have very distinct phenotypes, but they survive in those environments and they survive in those feed. And this is becoming an important thing, and I think even the Gates Foundation is now being able to be very interested in how do we take this information and now be able to make selection for animals that are based on their ability to survive in different environments. By, I hopefully have been able to show you, by collecting samples from these animals and being able to do sequencing, we can quickly begin to identify which genes are important and we can quickly begin to develop uh, breeding programs based on that. Traditionally, what we've had to do was set up big research farms. You know, I'm laughing at, at the experiment station, run these studies for 50 years and say, I think we found the answer. And now I think you can see that with next generation sequencing, these are experiments that can be done within several months where we begin to look at what are the unique attributes in the genome of, of animals that have been already selected over historical perspectives for those different regions. And then finally, the biomedical models. And as I said, on a personal basis, uh, I came here, uh, Reg Gomez hired me 20, in 1986 to come here, and I was a mouth geneticist, and one of the arguments was is we want to understand, uh, and I, Harris and Keith Kelly had put together a proposal, and 
uh, about hiring somebody who was to work on uh, genetics and disease resistance. And I, as I said, my mouse work was in that area. And I said, this can't be that hard. I mean, how hard can it be? And, and the goal was is that to, to, to take the mouse and, 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 and model and study. And, and so our concept was we just looked at mice as, as big, pigs as big mice and, and, and did that. And I hope that by today we've been able to show that that by genomics, we, we, we are there. We, we now can begin to, to do the same kind of experiments and the same studies. And the relevance of that is really important because, of, as I said, the pig, if you want to look at cardiovascular disease or cancer or drug metabolism, is a much more suitable model than a rodent. And, and, and we're excited about, I think, our work and the, the, now the ability to have the sequence for that is really important. And then finally, I really wanted to complete the story about TJ Tabasco. Uh, so TJ, uh, we, we have been able to clone TJ. We've been able to use her in biomedical models. Um, and she, she, because of the ability to do nuclear transfer, we, we, we have TJs always alive on campus, although the project's been going on for 10 years. Uh, and in this technology and this approach, I think really, I think you can see how it lends itself that we have a genetically defined model that we can clone. We, we've been able to put animals on uh, Jim Pettigrew and, and Animal Science has helped us develop some diets where we've been able to look at the onset uh, of, uh, of cardiovascular disease, uh, atherosclerosis, and, and we're really excited that this is a model that, that, that can really uh, bring a lot of new insights to, uh, to uh, animal research in the United States. And, and let me also give my disclaimer. Uh, when I was interviewed when we had the thing on national NPR, and I, they asked me how, what TJ was, and I said, well, we just had, I think Lisa's here tonight. She, we had a contest in the lab about naming the clones, and we took the names and, and made TJ Tabasco out of that, you know, typical kind of lab party. And within uh, 48 hours of the interview, I had a call from, a, uh, sorry, an email from a, a, a legal a firm in Denver asking me whether I had copyright uh, permission to use the, uh, so I thought that was a, so... Disclaimer, no, I do not. Well, let me sh close by saying that I've said we a lot tonight, and, and I really want to take this as an opportunity to, to, to really give credit to the we. Uh, as I said, I left, I came back, and I came back because of the environment here at the University of Illinois, and I want to make sure that's real clear. Uh, and, and part of it is this colleague's extraordinary. And, and my partners in crime, Harris Lewin and John Beaver, um, you know, I think we're really proud of what we've been able to achieve, and we've been able to achieve it because of the environment here on campus. I also want to say that, you know, you go, you get old, and you go around the world, and we have some of the best infrastructure there is. And, and I know Harris was involved in creating the Keck Center, but uh, Elvira Hernandez and the group there are, are better than anybody out there. And I, I say that in the sense that Martin Gronin, my colleague from Wagenen, was here. Uh, and he's doing, and the Dutch are very proud of, as you know, of, of their work. We did the samples here, and, uh, and he was, he, he's sending his samples now here to, to the Keck Center because of the quality of work. It's just you know, fantastic. I also want to thank my own lab. Um, you know, sometimes I've been accused of not being the easiest person to work with, uh, but uh, they've been tremendous, and particularly uh, I want to single out uh, Lori Run, who's uh, uh, just been uh, the, the best uh, lab partner you, you can imagine. And we've been very fortunate to have funding uh, from both the USDA and the NIH uh, to support this and, and, and also uh, su support from the, the college in the early stages that allowed us to get this support from the uh, USDA for our livestock genome in initiative. Because w I think Illinois should be, should be uh, we are proud and we should be proud of what we've been able to contribute and, and, and we've been able to contribute because we had in place the infrastructure and the support to, to really go out and, 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 and have the preliminary data to, to compete at the highest level. I also want to, my own personal colleagues, and this was a meeting we just had, and, and, uh, and uh, to look at diversity. It's a small group that represents, but uh, four people, in particular, as I mentioned, Alan Archibald at Edinburgh, who's really been a uh, colleague for almost 30 years, uh, Gregor Larson, uh, and, uh, and Martin Gronin, and, and Miguel. And in the three of them in the back, it's interesting I talk about the, the, the global significance of the University of Illinois because on, you know, 
Martin Gronin was here as a visiting professor in the Institute for Genomic Biology uh, because of the program here. As I already mentioned earlier, Miguel was here uh, 25 years ago as a person. And Gregor Larson, who I, when I first met him through correspondence, I swore he was from Sweden. He had done a, po he had done a postdoc when I first read his work. It was a postdoc in, in Uppsala, and I just swore and it's a, it's a and his dad was born here in Urbana. His, his grandmother's uh, was a step-grandfather is uh, Bill Everett. And uh, so when I invited him here, he goes, well, I'll just stay with my cousins. And I couldn't quite figure it out, but he's a, he's a tremendous uh, asset. Uh, and then our other, Lori here and, and Al Roker from Animal Sciences. So we're, we're continuing this work to look at uh, evolution and diversity of the pig. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, the, the University of Illinois leadership, uh, Dave Sheekwin at the time, Bob Easter, and, and continuing with Neil Merchant. Uh, um, as a faculty member, we couldn't have a, a better uh, group of people helping us uh, achieve. And this was a picture that uh, you know, we had when Secretary uh, Jen gave us our, our check for $10 million. Uh, fortunately, Bob was out in, in uh, San Diego when we did that. But, um, it was, it was I, I, I know I was the PI in the grant, but it really was the institution and, and, and the program that we had here at Illinois that, that, that carried the day. Um, so I thank you, and we open to the questions. I got it. No, I'm supposed to ask you to wait for the microphone, Dave. Okay, now can you hear me? Uh, uh, so this has to do with the fitness issue. So, I mean, wild boars, what's the average lifespan of a wild boar? I assume the domesticated pigs, it's only a few years. Yeah, that's a good, well, it, it's always this question about disease with, well, with, with the, the, the problem is, is we know the answer for the wild boar. And, and you know, and, and it's an interesting one because they, they actually, I don't know, this is where you get into the diet and all kinds of, but they actually sexually mature later. They, they, you know, the wild animals, they, they have bachelor herds. They, I mean, they, they, that's a whole, so it's kind of hard. I, I know your, the hard, your question, but it's hard because we don't have the, the, we don't have the real comparison, you know, because we've commercialized it so much that we, we don't have anything to compare it to. They, they survive, well, I mean, survive. The ones that we can still find eight, ten years. I mean, what, the wild boars. Yeah, yeah. Can, Yep. So they don't live 20 or 30 years there. No, and I think um, temperature, food, disease gets them after a while. But, you know, I mean, the, we, 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 the problem is having it something to compare them back to, you know. You know. But the fitness ones, we've, you know, the, 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 the energy one, and this is, a, this is an area where I think, again, um, we're, we're lucky here to have some people who really know energy, you know, metabolism and physiology, because that's, that's going to be your important one to figure that out. But, you know. Domestic pig. Well, there's no, is anyone from Iocook here? Yeah. Part of the problem we have is, is feed. You know, we feed them too much. So, I mean, if you're, so getting back, so we, we, we have diets that are meant to get an animal from, you know, 60 pounds to 300 pounds as fast as possible. What would that be? Well, how, would, how fast? Six months. Oof. Six months. Yeah. So, so, so the so now we get into so if we put them on a if you will a restricted diet, starve them. Um, you know that's what we need to be able to. Those are kind of you know so the so but if you put it an animal, well they get so big that they break down. I mean structurally they just get so big that you know it's like you know it's like a thousand pound person. They don't you know their joints don't do well. I mean that's what you see. So. So it's, those are hard experiments to do. Um, in this here, now there are, um, there are you know, free range you know, hog production in, in the UK and in Sweden that we're trying to get some access to samples on. That's good, but they're hard to do that. Because you know, the majority of people don't want to be involved in experiments, so it gets a little harder. That, one of the, that's one of the reasons it's driven us to South America. Again, because of the, there's a lot more free ranging, and the animals are, um, and we saw this a little bit in Sardinia, where um, communal grazing. I mean, so there's a lot more of that. So, so that we need to do a better job on it, Dave. Oh, why don't we do that one? Then we'll so you don't have to run it all the way across. 
Okay, the, you, you talked a lot about diversity, genetic diversity of pigs, but it, it's not clear to me whether what the relationship is between speciation and domestication. Are all the domesticated breeds derived from what can be considered biologically as a single species? Or have there been multiple domestication events from different species? And so, if that is true, uh, can you still interbreed them? Well, I, I know it's a complicated it's question. A, it's a good, well, it's the heart of what we're trying to sort. Let me start backwards, Victor. They still can interbreed. All right. And, and this has uh, been a problem, and, and, and that's actually we started getting into this with the captive breeding program in, 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 the, that's in Java, because that was exactly what's happening. And then you go, well, wait a second. These are these are, these weren't really they're not really species. species. But interesting, um, the conversation we had with Oliver Ryder, who's at the San Diego Zoo, he has this new hypothesis that this is, you know, speciation through hybridization or extinction through hybridization, so it can go both ways. Interesting, one of the things that we haven't seen, back to your point, is reproductive genes. I mean, that, that, you know, in some cases we could see, well, this is why you can't get implantation, things like that. But we, we need a little more deeper coverage in some of the sequencing for that. But so the short answer is you still don't know. Still don't know. That's usually my all, only answer. <laughs> oh, here, I can take it. Can you say a little bit more about contemporary thinking about the original domestication events? The, the reason I ask this question is it seemed to me that you sort of gave a model of the pig gets trapped, it sort of gets selected for uh, more meat and muscle, and then there are behavioral consequences. When one might imagine that early on there were behavioral differences that were what were being accidentally selected for because the pigs that were hanging around the garbage and were more easily trappable were uh, already disposed to some uh, behaviors in, let's say, the right direction. And then once you had them, you'd be able to go uh, beyond that. So, so how about, um, it seems to me, behaviors on both, end of the, both ends of the equation. Yes. Um, I, I, that's why what we're trying to do, I mean, I, you, going backwards is hard, to, you know, but you're right. I mean, what basically you can say is a pig smart. So what happened was, you know, anybody's, you know, Pig hunting is still a, a major sport because these animals are just impossible to hunt. I mean, they're smart, they're wiry, they get in the brush, you, you can't get them, and it's expensive, and it's very expensive. But then all of a sudden you realize that all you need is a garbage dump. They just come out of the woods. You don't have to go, you don't have to go do all that work. You just make a garbage dump, they come, and they're there. And put a fence around them, you leave them alone, they breed, and all of a sudden you've got a lot of them. So you're right, there is a certain behavior there that, that was obvious to man, too. So there's a behavior. That's why we're trying to look at each one of these areas because one, well, only one way we say was, is it was it the same thing that was the result the same in every area? We we're trying to look at the wild populations still in those areas that haven't been domesticated to see are are they unique? So we, that's what we need to do some some more analysis. But so we're going back to each of those. Now, unfortunately, Gregor said, "Oh, I think I found five more." So, but you know, for, so we're trying to take the five five of them and say, okay. Let's take the, the, the wild animals that are still there and get a signature of those, and then the, 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 the domesticated animals that have come from that area and, and, and ask, answer that question more directly. Yeah, like I say, one of the flaws we did is we pooled right now, and we can't, we don't have any way of delineating that. So. He doesn't need a microphone. Have you seen any evidence yet uh, that the so-called wild pigs have interbred with some of the, um, you know, feral pigs? So has there been some reverse, you know, or in, you know, are they really now uh, completely well, actually, wild, wild, wild pigs? Like what's happened with cattle? Well, we can see, well, you know, the, the domesticated. Right. Uh, there, there's two groups there. The yeah, there are two groups. There, are, there still is the wild. I mean. Uh, and then there are where there have been feral pigs, and then they breed, and you get 
Pogzillas, you know. I mean, that's what you, you know. You got these animals that have been selected, for, you know, genetically selected for bigger growth and stuff, and then they get that F1, and they, you know, they, you see them on the website, you know, like here's this, you know, thousand, fifteen hundred pig. But that's that that seems to be small. Now, we haven't done a very good job on our feral analysis. I that I didn't, and 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 uh, Ned Hahn actually. Is, is shared here, as, you, as many of you may know, it was involved a lot of feral pets as part of the Sudarabi studies for years, and and Ned was kind enough to give us his samples, and we haven't we haven't done an analysis on those yet. But we, you know, to answer your question, it kind of addresses the question that Victor raised before, because uh, if the F1s were fertile and fit you would probably see more of the introgression from the feral pigs back into the wild pigs. They're probably not that fit when they, when they cross with the feral pigs. Would you agree? Yeah, but we don't see, there, there, are, there aren't that many, or I mean, it's hard, you know, our ability to get feral pig samples is, is small, it's hard. They just, they don't do well in the wild. But now in any of these um, sort of wild, spe uh, or, or what you were calling cousins, the different suets, yep. uh, you don't see any evidence uh, of, of gene flow from... We haven't done those studies, so, and that's what Victor point. We haven't done those studies. In fact, what we, what we intentionally did was make sure we didn't have that problem. So with our SNP analysis, we've actually separated out so that there is no evidence that, there's been, that the animals we're looking at have any hybridization, so we could get some baseline. You know, to go back and ask those questions, but you know, so that we haven't done that yet. Yep. But we've intentionally like so when we sequence it, this really is a celebensis and not, not a hybrid. Yep. Yep. Well, I guess I'm supposed to remind you to tell everybody we can go party now, Bob. <laughs> I will confess, since I've had the administrative lobotomy, I wasn't quite able to follow some, <laughs> some bits, but very well done. And we, we truly appreciate the leadership that you and your colleagues uh, provide to the University of Illinois in, in these domains and, and beyond our campus, literally worldwide. Thank you very much.